Hello, I'm Mark Unka for Executive Director of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association, and, and welcome to our uh, Smart Cities Committee webinars, Smarter Cities and Communities with Fiber Optic Sensing. And to kick things off, I will turn things over to our chairman, Kent Wardley. Kent? Thank you, Mark, and welcome, everybody, and I uh, appreciate you taking the time out for this pretty exciting uh, webinar. It's Smarter Cities and Communities with Fiber Optic Sensing. It's going to be presented by uh, Dr. Giovanni Maloney from uh, NEC Laboratories in America. And um, we look forward to uh, hear more about his, his webinar here. So thank you, everybody, for attending. Go ahead, Gio. Thanks, Mark and Kent. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Good evening, everybody, depending on where you are. My, my name is Giovanni. I'm a senior researcher at NEC Laboratories America in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, I'm also the chair of the Smart Cities Committee of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association. And today we're gonna to talk about uh, smarter cities and communities with fiber optic sensing. Basically how fiber optic sensing, maybe something you've heard of or, or haven't heard of, uh, can be used for smart cities and communities. So the first thing I wanna do is pose a question or a, a thought. When you think smart cities and communities, what do you think? Uh, maybe some of us, uh, don't know what a smart city or community is. Maybe some of us have preconceived notions about what a smart city and community is. Uh, but nonetheless, what you usually see are some of these very fancy images of uh, cities, usually uh, at nighttime with all the lights on and these interconnecting lines that make it look very futuristic, uh, like uh, things are connected and there's a lot of technology going on. And uh, usually when you think smart cities and communities, you think things like the Internet of Things, IoT. Or these days you might think 5G, uh, or you might even think uh, CV to X, which means cellular vehicle to X, which is related to uh, self-driving cars and, and autonomous vehicles. Uh, but today, what I want to do is to draw a picture and, and uh, kind of educate the community on how, when we think of these typical things for smart cities like IoT, 5G, CV to X, and we see these pictures, I want us all also to now think fiber optic sensing in the same breath. Because actually fiber optic sensing is a natural way to help smart cities and communities. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and describe that throughout the presentation. First, let's also ask ourselves, why should cities and communities be smart to begin with? And to answer that question, let's look at uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These are 17 uh, interlinked global goals, a collection of 17 interlinked global goals that are designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all by the year 2030. These are goals that were put together by the United Nations addressing various things as you can see here in the slide. And of course, if you look here at goal number 11, you see sustainable cities and communities is, is a, certainly a goal by the United Nations that needs to be addressed. If we look at some specific points from that goal, by 2030, uh, the United Nations is looking for the world to provide access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport systems. Expand infrastructure and upgrade technology for supplying modern and sustainable energy services. And upgrade infrastructure and retrofit industries to make them sustainable with increased resource use efficiency. And, and of course, though a lot of those things make, make sense. And these things are tied to the fact that our society is uh, basically unabated in population growth and the techniques that we have today to have population in, in uh, cities and communities that are growing, uh, they may not be able to support uh, those that growth and we're going to have to pretty much get smarter to be able to deal with it. And that's nothing new. I think we all understand that when we say smart cities and communities, uh, but for sure this is the motivation. We, we need uh, to do something. We need to get smarter as cities and communities start to grow to be able to address all of these points uh, uh, that the United Nations addressed in the Sustainable Development Goals. So now let's ask ourselves, what makes a smart city or community smart? Why are we using the word smart? What, what is it that is smart about a city or community? Well, let's take a look at the uh, US Smart Cities and Communities Act, which actually just recently had some movement uh, in, in May. Uh, it, and in this act, they kind of, uh, they they outline what a smart city and community is. It gathers and incorporates data from systems, devices, and sensors embedded in civic systems and infrastructure, aggregates and analyzes the gathered data, communicates analysis and data, makes corresponding improvements to civic systems and services based on gathered data, 
coordinates with relevant public and private sector entities like electric, water, telecom, energy, transportation. So that's pretty straightforward. Maybe we even knew that was a smart city or community already. Uh, but the key thing here is sensors. Uh, to do everything written here on this slide, you need sensors. So at the heart of a smart city, at the heart of smart are sensors. So let's take a look at what we, uh, what we know to be some canonical sensors some typical sensors that are used every day. Here in this photo, I show some cameras, some video cameras, and some microphones. But of course, there are many different types of sensors out there, accelerometers, geophones, capacitive sensors. Uh, even those sensors, when you pull up to a traffic light and uh, you're in, in, uh, basically on top of a metal loop that's inductive that tells the traffic light to turn red or green, there are many different types of sensors, uh, in thermometers, et cetera, uh, that can be used. But the commonality amongst all those disparate sensors is they are all, almost all based on electronics. Uh, they all have electronics in them. Uh, and therefore, they require electrical power. Uh, and actually, once you have the electrical power, now you need to talk to those sensors to get the data out of them. So they have to be wired or wireless uh, communicated with. Uh, and now because they're electronic and they're using electrical power and even the wired and wireless communication is gonna be uh, somewhat electronic based, they're affected by electromagnetics and uh, like lightning strikes or power surges or uh, static electric and magnetic fields. Uh, and they're also affected by extreme environments like extreme pressure, extreme temperature, uh, extreme uh, and, and other things like that. Some of these sensors like camera are visibility dependent. So depending on the time of day or depending on the lighting conditions or the weather, you, they, their uh, performance may change. And some of these sensors are line of sight. Uh, uh, they require a line of sight. You have to be able, if something's blocking uh, the sensor, uh, it will be very difficult for it to do the sensing. And actually something that, and all these things I think are kind of uh, well known to some extent, but something that's a little bit uh, not so well known is the fact that even if you were to use all these sensors, uh, and of course we are using all these sensors, you have to synchronize them all. So you can imagine multitudes of sensors that are all being communicated with and, and now you have to synchronize them. And that in itself is a bit of a challenge. Uh, and in addition, especially in the past few years, uh, so we have to think about privacy now, how cameras and things like microphones uh, affect our privacy. So I'd like to pose something a little bit different than some of these typical sensors. I'd, I'd like to think about fiber optics. So let me explain fiber optics from the perspective of ubiquity. Uh, fiber optics are ubiquitous. Uh, so first, what is a fiber optic? It's basically a long strand of glass and in which light travels. Uh, fiber optics uh, have now pervaded most of our telecommunication infrastructure because I, in comparison to copper cables, light can travel extremely longer distances uh, with extremely lower loss. And at this point, we have per basically perfected fiber optic technology to the point where we understand almost everything about it. We can uh, send data at speeds that we never dreamed uh, we could send it at, and we can do it with efficacy that we never thought we could do it at. So fiber optics are now ubiquitous in, uh, in society, in our, in our existing telecommunication infrastructure. Let's take a look at that uh, a little bit. So on the upper left-hand corner, we have a map of all the submarine uh, cables uh, throughout the, the world. Uh, if you've never seen a map like this, it's actually uh, it, both um, impressive and uh, shocking that we have this many fiber optic cables underneath the ocean. Now, this is actually something that NEC does. We, we make these fiber optic cables and we put them under the ocean. As you can see, they're connecting every single continent here. Uh, and so every continent is connected by a fiber optic cable under the ocean. If you look on the upper right hand corner, this is just a schematic map of uh, the, the, all the optical fibers between the cities of the United States. And basically every, almost every single city or every major city is connected by optical fibers. And as we go down in granularity and we look at a particular city, and in this case, in the bottom left-hand corner, we have Houston. As you can see, this is just one telecom carrier, one company that's providing fiber optic service. And you can see that their fiber optics are all around the city. And, and of course, there are many different service providers in, in cities. So you, you, if you put all their maps of fiber optics on top of each other, at the, in, the, in just a major city, the fiber optics are everywhere. And in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, this is pr pretty much a standard uh, IT room or, or data center in, in a building. So even at the granularity of a single building, the building uh, is 
is ubiquitous with optical fibers. So our existing telecom infrastructure today is uh, basically is a fiber optic, and fiber optic are ubiquitous in the infrastructure. And that's interesting from the perspective of uh, can we use that for sensing? We already have all these fibers all over the place. They're under the ocean, they're between cities, they're in cities, they're in buildings. Can we actually use those as the sensors? Uh, and the answer is yes, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And that's what we call fiber optic sensing. In fiber optic sensing, we are basically using a fiber optic as a sensor. Uh, there are many ways to do fiber optic sensing, but maybe uh, the, one of the typical ways is to launch laser light into one end of the optical fiber. And as the laser light's traveling, it does something called scattering. It's basically it's sending a minuscule amount of light backwards towards the beginning of the fiber. Uh, there's different types of scattering. Uh, the words that we use to describe them are Raman, Brillion, and Rayleigh. But what they really mean is that there are different ways that the light interacts with the glass. And those different ways that the light interacts with the glass lends themselves towards different kind of environmental things. Raman is typically associated with temperature. Brillion is typically associated with strain. And Rayleigh is typically associated with acoustics. And so basically, by sending light into an optical fiber, and by detecting the light that scatters, it comes backwards, just this minuscule amount of light. And by looking at the different kinds of that light, whether it's Raman, Brillion, or Rayleigh, we can detect different things going on around that fiber, whether it be temperature, strain, or acoustics. Uh, and that's kind of amazing because uh, we don't actually need to, uh, the fiber itself is the sensor. And it's becoming a sensor simply by launching light into one end of it. And we can do this over very long distances. Uh, we can do this even up to 100 miles in some cases. Uh, and actually, and we actually not only can we sense things like temperature, strain, and acoustics along this fiber, but we could exactly locate them to within a few feet or within a few meters, depending on what units you want to work with. So that's an amazing thing about fiber optic sensing. Using just a fiber by just launching light inside, we can locate things like temperature, strain, and acoustics to within a few feet or within a few meters. We can do this over tens of many tens of miles, even up to things like 100 miles. And uh, it has all these tremendous benefits. And because we can do this, we can monitor uh, a single fiber optic cable from a single location. Uh, we are able to do this 24-7 uh, continuously over these long distances. Uh, because we can uh, do this, uh, we can locate something to within a few feet. Basically, we are creating thousands of sensing points along those along that optical fiber. Basically, using optical fiber sensing, fiber optic sensing, we are converting every few feet of that fiber optic into a veritable sensor. If you were to actually take a canonical sensor, like a thermometer or a microphone, and put it right next to the fiber, and you were to detect with that thermometer microphone temperature or, or acoustics, and you were to show the data from the thermometer and the microphone, and then show the data from the fiber optic, they're actually very, not very different. So we are, we are veritably, effectively, we are with fiber optic sensing, we are converting a single fiber optic every few feet into uh, a veritable sensor. And that's, and that's it, and that's the novelty of optical fiber sensing. All these optical fiber sensors, ubiquitously over cities and communities, just by plugging in um, these, this technology at one end of the optical fiber, we can convert all of those fiber optics into sensing of, of temperature, vibration, strain, et cetera. And actually at the bottom of the screen, this is what that looks like. This typically, there are many different interrogators out there. Many different, many people make different types of uh, interrogators. The interrogator is the electronics, the optic electronics that sends the laser light into the fibers and receives the scattering and does the analysis of, of temperature, vibration, strain. And, and these things are actually no bigger than an Xbox. And they look no different than a standard equipment in an IT room. And so by simply plugging them into the beginning of an optical fiber, uh, you, um, you can do all the sensing. And all the advantages are self-evident. Uh, with, with fiber optic sensing, uh, this interrogator being centrally located, along the optical fiber, there are no electronics. Along the optical fiber, there's no electrical power. Along the optical fiber, there's no uh, independent wired or wireless communication like Wi-Fi or something else. Uh, the fiber is unaffected by electromagnetics in extreme environments like extreme temperatures and pressures. 
It's visibility independent. So on a rainy or sunny day, it still works. Uh, on a foggy day or night or day, depending on glare and lighting conditions, it still works. It doesn't require line of sight. Uh, if uh, something's like is blocking the view of a camera, fiber optic sensing may still be uh, able to sense. Uh, and again, uh, the, they're a fiber optic because we're using the same laser light to detect at every point along this fiber optic. It's inherently synchronized. So you are, we are converting with this interrogator, with fiber optic sensing, every few feet of the fiber into a veritable independent sensor. And, and that comprises over many miles, thousands of sensors. And they're inherently synchronized. They're all synchronized with each other. There's no need to sync them up to a universal clock or, or anything like this. And of course, because it's just the fiber sensing these ambient things in the environment, it doesn't uh, infringe on any privacy or anything like that. So it's a very interesting technology. It's, uh, so I'd like to think of it as a smarter way uh, to do sensing and, and to make cities and communities uh, much smarter. And now if we go back and we look at a uh, typical city, and now we think about fiber optics being ubiquitous throughout the city, maybe there are fiber optics uh, along every single street and every single intersection. Uh, maybe these fiber optics were already installed by the Department of Transportation to talk to cameras or other sensors. Maybe there are fiber optics out in, uh, in the um, energy infrastructure like uh, in this picture, you see the um, the wind power, or maybe there's a solar farm or, or something else. Maybe uh, these fiber optics could be connected around the perimeter of an airport. Uh, the point is, the ubiquity of optical fibers now allows you to basically just plug in these fiber optic sensors, these interrogators, and convert all, everywhere along these fibers into sensors. And it makes a very exciting proposition for smart cities and communities. And you can start to, as I just uh, kind of outlined in the previous slide, you can start to imagine a number of different applications. Here are a bunch of applications that the members of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association have kind of identified and put together. But, but you yourself could imagine multitudes of other applications uh, with fiber optic sensing. Uh, fiber optic sensing could be used to monitor pipelines. Uh, it could be used to monitor leaks or overheating or, or people trying to tap the pipelines. Uh, it can be used to monitor people, uh, third-party intrusion or security, like uh, someone trying to uh, infringe on the uh, perimeter of an airport or a national border. Uh, it could actually pick up things like earthquakes or, or things uh, like landslides and rock falls along roads or other parts of cities. We could monitor the transportation infrastructure, uh, the vehicles driving along the, uh, the roads and highways of cities or trains uh, along the train tracks. Uh, we can monitor the energy infrastructure, the oil and gas uh, wells, the pipelines that run the wells, the storage facilities of oil and gas. Uh, we can monitor factories and other industrial processes. We can actually monitor the structural health of the roads themselves or the dams and bridges inside the city. If there's a fiber optic, we can detect vibration and we can see all the strange things going, along, uh, going on in, in those, in those uh, structural things. And we can mo monitor all sorts of the power infrastructure like power cables uh, and, and things like that. So it, it's actually quite amazing. As long as there's an optical fiber there, we could, we could do sensing and we could do monitoring and we can address all these things about smart cities and communities that need to be done with, with the advantage uh, that we don't need electrical power along the fiber. We don't need wire to wireless communication uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So of course, uh, it would take me forever to go through all the applications in detail, but FOSA has a wonderful YouTube page where we have created many different uh, webinars addressing uh, various different things and different perspectives. And, and there are, there are uh, I can't even count the number of webinars that we have on the webpage. So we'll go through a few examples now today uh, of how fiber optic sensing can be used for smart cities and communities, but please feel free to visit the Fiber Optic Sensing Association YouTube page. Feel free to subscribe and check out, uh, it, do a deeper dive into all of these use cases of fiber optic sensing uh, for other, ap other uh, applications or, or specifically for smart cities and communities. So let's, let's take a look at a few examples of how fiber optic sensing specifically can be used for smart cities and communities. Let's first take a look at surface transportation. So what I'm showing you here is basically, let's start with the, the, the uh, image in the bottom left-hand corner. It's a map of Dallas, of Dallas, Texas. And the red line, the blue line represent fiber optic uh, cables around Dallas as part of Verizon's telecommunication network. And so basically we uh, plug in 
fiber optic sensors to those fibers of Verizon's telecom network in Dallas. And the top image here is the fiber optic sensing data. And of course, uh, like all telecom carriers, uh, when they deploy fiber optics for their telecom networks, they're deploying them along roads and highways and things like this. And so what we see here in this fiber optic sensing data on the top, we see all this these signals representing vehicles driving in different directions on those roads and highways. The, the, the crisscrossing lines, if you will, kind of represent vehicles traveling at different directions and each line represents a different vehicle. So this is kind of amazing. Just by plugging in again, one of those interrogators to one end of these uh, optical fiber cables in the city of Dallas, which are many tens of kilometers long, and in some cases, 50 kilometers long, we can see vehicles driving all over the highways. Now, of course, you could do this at uh, toll booths and, and uh, on other parts of the highways with a camera, but you'd have to then deploy cameras everywhere. So the, the difference is that with fiber optic sensing, you can not just sense where cameras and other sensors are, you can sense continuously as long as there's a fiber optic there. And again, we can see the same information as cameras, such as the, uh, the direction that vehicles are moving, the speed that vehicles are going, uh, traffic congestion, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at this bottom gra middle graphic on the bottom here, it's basically what we did is we compared the ability to sense traffic with fiber optic sensing with uh, when we compared it to video analytics using a video camera. And the moral of the story and these graphs on the right, all they say is that when we, when we plot uh, the traffic information, traffic flow, speed of the fiber optic sensing data and the video camera data, they're basically the same, they're one-to-one. -one. So we can detect, fiber optic sensing has the ability to detect typical traffic information like traffic flow, speed, direction, it can detect the same information with the same efficacy as video cameras. And again, the difference being, it doesn't just do it where the video camera is, it does it all over the highways, wherever the fiber is. And as one other point, this network uh, also had live telecommunication data running in it. So not only can we use the existing telecommunication infrastructure to do sensing of things like traffic, but we, we're actually doing it a lot without interfering with the actual communication. And, and, that's, and that's very exciting because that means that we could basically plug in fiber optic sensors anywhere and, and start to do the sensing. Here's a great image by, um, by OptiSense uh, where they're doing the, the same thing, something similar. Uh, here's the fiber optic sensing data kind of streaming down and they're taking that data and applying algorithms to it to create uh, traffic uh, information, traffic flow, average speeds to plot congestion, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So as a user, this would be something that you would look at if you were using fiber optic sensing to do some traffic management. As a, this is a wonderful example by Optisense. Here's an example by uh, BP Fotech. Uh, and uh, they are also uh, doing the same thing. The difference here, instead of vehicles, they are monitoring light rail in Canada. And that's, that's very interesting. You can kind of see, if you look at the fiber optic sensing data, now you've seen a couple of these fiber optic sensing data plots. You maybe are becoming an expert like me. Clearly, the, the, each line represents a uh, light rail and the crisscross and the different directions uh, represents the, the, the lines are crossing represents the direction that the vehicles are going. There's a lot of actual information that can be derived from, from this and the other uh, examples I just showed. You can derive uh, vehicle speed, you can, uh, whether it's uh, a car or a rail, you can, you can get congestion information, you can see where the vehicles stop, you can see where there's traffic, where there, you can see, even see where there are pedestrians. Uh, so it's, it's, and again, the difference is you can do this continuously all over the rail, the highway, the road, uh, it, again, simply by plugging in this interrogator, this fiber optic sensor, to one end of an optical fiber. No electrical power is required along the optical fiber. No wired or wireless communication is being used. It's simply the light goes in and, come and scatters right back. Uh, it's immune to electromagnetic interference, uh, the temperature swings in the day, et cetera, et cetera. And, and finally, in terms of surface transportation, here's an example of an autonomous vehicle driving down a road. And, uh, and, and so all, everything I just explained, all the advantages of fiber optic sensing to monitor traffic information, and, but now this is helping to guide this autonomous vehicle. 
And that's very exciting because that lends itself towards the burgeoning CV to X uh, industry that's coming, the cellular vehicle to something, X means something that's coming where autonomous vehicles need to be able to talk to the roads, talk to each other and talk to people. And fiber optic sensing is gonna be a big part of that. By using fiber optic sensing, as in this example, we're gonna be able to assist CV to X and autonomous vehicles to navigate and start to usher in that revolution hitting all those benefits uh, that the United Nations laid out in the social development goal. And now if uh, we take a look at this slide, um, what, what I'm describing here is not just the ability to monitor traffic along roads and highways, but actually to be able to sense and monitor the health of the road and highways themselves. And we, we can call that resilience because of course, Roads and highways exhibit significant wear and tear, uh, especially in New Jersey with the changing seasons, the road will crack and it will expand and all these things and they're constantly repairing and servicing it. And right now they have to manually drive around or someone has to call and tell them where this is happening. But actually with fiber optic sensing, we can uh, actually determine the if the road is healthy or not, if there's a pothole and to some extent even the degree of uh, severity uh, or damage of, of that um, of the pothole, et cetera. So in, uh, basically what you're looking at in the top left hand corner is we use fiber optic sensing and we compared it to a typical sensor like an accelerometer. Uh, so when vehicles were driving over these uh, different types of potholes, as you can see in the images below uh, in, along roads in Dallas, uh, we were getting different types of vibration information in the fiber optic sensor. Uh, and we were comparing it to the accelerometer. And basically using artificial intelligence, we dumped this into a very sophisticated or very not sophisticated, depending on how you view it, uh, artificial intelligence algorithm. And we could determine poor, good, and fair, different degrees of quality of the road itself, just by having the vehicles naturally drive over the road. Uh, so that, that's very interesting. So not just transportation, but also the ability to look at the health of roads and highways by simply plugging in this interrogator to one end of an optical fiber. Uh, here's another example. Uh, actually, this is in New Jersey, uh, some length of optical, maybe about 10 kilometers of optical fiber. Another thing that you'd want to detect is uh, people excavating along um, your infrastructure, roads and highways. Uh, you, you want to be able to determine if their excavation is damaging uh, sewer lines, fiber optic cables, power lines. Uh, and fiber optic cables aren't just buried. Fiber optic cables are also, of course, um, aerially uh, deployed along poles. And so in what you're looking at here is basically the monitoring over fiber optic cable that's buried and along aerial poles. And what we're detecting is abnormal events. So using artificial intelligence, we can take that fiber optic sensing data and we can determine if there is a normal abnormal event associated with someone impinging upon the infrastructure of the road itself. So perhaps there's unscheduled construction or perhaps there's scheduled construction that's working in the wrong place. Uh, fiber optic sensing can instantly pick that up. They can instantly locate it to uh, within a few feet. Uh, and, uh, and you can kind of prevent uh, damage to your infrastructure. You can, uh, you can quickly send somebody out to stop them and all this stuff. And again, simply by connecting an interrogator to the beginning of an optical fiber cable, you're able to do a, a significant amount of sensing without other sensors. And now let's let's talk about uh, energy a little bit, or even envir in the environment. And uh, a big part of energy in the environment is oil and gas. And oil and gas transport is, of course, uh, done by pipelines. And so uh, one of the biggest issues with pipelines in many countries is illegal tapping. Uh, with pipelines, people will try to uh, cut into the sides of the pipelines, et cetera, uh, take out uh, the, the oil and gas, and, and, it's, and over the uh, very long lengths of the pipelines, it's very difficult to detect this. And of course, the significance of that is that uh, leaking pipelines, when people intrude upon them, uh, can cause pollution, uh, which is very, you know, which uh, is something very difficult to deal with, and, and also can cause loss in, uh, for the oil and gas companies, which then in, in increases cost to the, to the customer, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, fiber optic sensing can help with this by putting a fiber optic along a pipeline. Uh, again, uh, to an accuracy, every few feet, every few meters along that fiber, uh, you can pinpoint events like people tapping into the pipeline, cutting into the pipe. Uh, 
uh, people walking around the pipeline, uh, or et cetera, et cetera. So you could prevent pipeline intrusion. Yeah, uh, in this case, this is a great slide by Fotech. They were able to detect 26 hot tapping attempts in six months and prevent uh, significant pollution, prevent significant loss to oil and gas, which ultimately is uh, preventing any kind of uh, negative um, outcome to the customer. And it's not just intrusion, but you could even, uh, by putting the fiber optic in the right place, you could detect leaks. So one fiber can do multiple things. Uh, one fiber could detect someone tapping into a pipe, a pipe, but the same fiber, if you place it correctly, could also determine if that pipe is starting to leak. Uh, these highly pressurized pipes will, will push out a, a lot of um, uh, a lot of fluid if if, there, if some of the pipe integrity starts to be compromised. Uh, and so, using either vibration or temperature uh, or some combination, you could determine uh, the location of the leaks and quickly mitigate it. Again, uh, reducing the effects of um, pollution and, and uh, oil and gas spills, et cetera, et cetera. And this is kind of amazing because otherwise, you wouldn't be able to. I uh, use um, these canonical sensors, it'd be almost impossible to put a sensor every 10 meters or every, every 100 meters along the long length of these pipelines. And this is significant uh, around uh, cities and communities uh, because it, even while pipelines will be out in the wilderness, they still come into cities and communities and, and, uh, expect, and that's, that's where people are. And so you want to have uh, the best protection uh, as you can. As another example, let's look at uh, the electrical, uh, our electrical power infrastructure. Uh, and you know, typically, when you when power cables fail, uh, you know, the um, they will create arcing. And so, to detect that, what uh, what people typically do is they have to actually go out to the power line. Uh, they have to go and uh, visually inspect the power the, the power cable. Uh, and over the many miles of power cables, especially uh, within a city or community, this could be a very dangerous process. It could be a very difficult process. It, it could uh, be a very time-consuming process. So uh, putting in the perspective of uh, the recent wildfires in the United States, which uh, some may have been caused by uh, failing power cables, it's very difficult to, uh, and it's very important to quickly and effectively locate power cable faults. Uh, to prevent uh, kind of a, these natural disasters that we've been seeing recently, like wildfires. And fiber optic sensing can help with that. Uh, if you have a fiber optic along one of these power cables, uh, by what they, you can do is you can send a large pulse of electricity down this power cable. And basically, wherever that fault is, it, it, will, it will create a, a, a shock wave. And so uh, the, the fault location is clearly uh, evident in this shock wave, which you don't need to be a fiber optic expert to kind of see that, that pattern there. So by simply identifying the location uh, of, this, um, of this kind of shape on the shock wave, you can identify the location of the power fault. This will significantly reduce the amount of time it takes to go out to the field and, and find the fault and repair it. And then of course, uh, prevent some of these natural disasters like forest fires um, that are being caused by, by some of this stuff. So it's, it's, it's quite amazing. And again, simply by plug, plugging in an interrogator to one side of the fiber optic, you're, you're able to do all these things. And so now finally, let me talk a little bit about um, cables and fiber installation. And of course, what, what, I talk, what I kind of focused on today was existing fiber optic infrastructure and fiber optic infrastructure is growing and, and, and the, the great cable and fiber companies are continuing to deploy more and more fiber every day and, and it's, going to con it's going to continue to grow. And of course they do it in mind uh, to, for telecommunication. Uh, and, and they do this uh, uh, by directly bearing fiber, or they, they do this in conduit. Uh, but of course you, you can now start to think, why, how about we deploy our fiber optics with sensing in mind uh, in addition to communication? And uh, at FOSA, we, we, uh, the, the term for this is dig once. So when you deploy your fiber optics in these cities and communities, you're deploying it, of course, with a communication mind, but you're also deploying it so that you can sense optimally. Maybe when you deploy the fiber, you, you, you bury it in such a way, you put it in a certain conduit, you use a certain cable, such that not only is it going to be able to provide the telecommunication functionality, but it can have optimal sensing ability of traffic along a highway or it could sense the health of that highway or road, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this is very important as, as cities and communities start to grow, uh, that we start to think about, uh, again, the 
the usefulness of fiber optic sensing, the advantages it has um, to complement or to kind of replace other canonical sensors like cameras and et cetera, and how as we build out our smart cities and communities, we think we should build out the fiber optic infrastructure that's going is inevitably going to be ubiquitous such that it can do the sensing as well. So as a quick summary, uh, the goal of this was to kind of teach you that fiber optic sensing is as important to smart cities and communities as 5G, IoT, and CV to X. So I hope now when you think smart cities and communities, you think fiber optic sensing. And uh, why should uh, cities and communities be smart to begin with? Well, because of the global unabated societal growth. And, uh, to deal, and of course, for smart cities and uh, communities, sensors are at the heart of them being smart. So to address uh, the global unabated societal growth, to, to meet all of the United Nations social development goals, canonical sensors are good, but there's going to be a limitation. So we should look to fiber optics and their ubiquity in existing telecom infrastructure, because they are ubiquitous. Fiber optics are everywhere. They are a, a, could be a smarter way to sense in smart cities. No electrical power is required along the optical fiber, no electronics along the optical fiber, no wire to wireless communication. Uh, they can withstand extreme temperatures and pressures, uh, and they can sense with the same efficacy as some of these other sensors. And of course, some of the use cases, as we described, in include surface transportation, the ability to detect vehicles such as cars or even trains all around the city. And instead of just uh, sensing like other sensors at particular points, the fiber optics can do this continuously along roads over many, many, many tens of kilometers, as we showed. And they can provide the same uh, traffic information as the other sensors uh, with the same efficacy, of course, doing this continuously over the highways. In terms of resilience, we can monitor the, our infrastructure, whether it be the transportation infrastructure, like the roads and highways themselves. We can determine their health such that we can rapidly repair them. We can, we can prevent uh, damage to this infrastructure using fiber optic sensing to detect uh, things like uh, unscheduled digging or digging in the wrong place, et cetera. We can uh, protect our power infrastructure by monitoring uh, the power lines and, and oil and gas pipelines, for example. And that lends itself towards environmental governance because the ability to better protect our power infrastructure, the, elect the electrical, oil and gas, we can prevent natural disasters like forest fires and oil leaks, et cetera. Uh, and, of, and of course, we can uh, now have more examples like public safety. But again, uh, the, the, the great thing about fiber optic sensing is that the fiber optics are already there. And even if they're not already there, they're coming because fiber optics are going to be continue to be deployed. So if we deploy them the right way, then we'll be able to sense even better. And they have all the advantages uh, uh, of, uh, like I described. And so now I, I hope that you are as educated on fiber optic sensing as me. And I hope that now when you think smart cities and communities, you also think fiber optic sensing. So uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Gio, for a very informative presentation. Uh, to ask a question, you can insert it in the box uh, to the right. Um, and uh, if we haven't made people smarter already, we will do so with the question. Uh, let me lead up uh, uh, by answering to the question. Let me lead off with kind of a, a bit of a challenge is, is that we seem to be using fiber for a variety of, of sort of different applications and obviously depending on the fiber to be in place. Would you comment a little bit on, on what the business models are um, to accommodate to basically paying for some of these applications? That, that's a great question, Mark, and may, maybe I'll make one comment, and if Stuart's on the line, maybe Stuart has some more insight, but of course, and this ties into some of FOSA's other efforts, uh, the coming infrastructure bill uh, is, of course, is very uh, smart city and community centric. There's going to be a lot of investment by the government into improving through technology the infrastructure like roads and uh, our, our power infrastructure, et cetera. And so some government investment is definitely going to be a mechanism with which we can start to invest in fiber optic sensing to all, do all these great things. But, uh, but I'll also let Stuart, he probably has some uh, better insight than me. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Really nice job with the webinar there. Uh, so Stuart um, from uh, Photek. Uh, so yeah, my thoughts just actually, in thinking about the uh, telecoms companies actually, uh, and cities, you know, some cities install their own fiber, but obviously a large amount of fiber, or 
vast majority is installed by telcos. And uh, yeah, this is fine that needs to be installed anyway. But what we've got here is an opportunity to further monetize that fiber, add value to it. And of course, there's multiple customers for one installation. So this sensing is going to be useful to you know, a number of different authorities uh, that will benefit from that data. Uh, and also we've got the challenge of the digital divide. Uh, yeah, there are um, areas of cities that are underserved by fiber. Uh, of course, the wealthier areas uh, perhaps get the connectivity they need because it's seen that uh, they'll be able to uh, pay their way. Um, but you know, more deprived areas, uh, you know, the business case is harder uh, to install that fiber. But if you're getting extra value uh, from it by the sensing and the data you're going to produce, uh, then that could help with the justification. Well, thank you. And let me, let me kind of elaborate on that. Uh, obviously, one of the frequently the ways that folks uh, look at smart cities is focusing on the uh, wireless applications and particularly with uh, uh, the, ins the, um, uh, the expansion of 5G as it gets uh, uh, spread out and, and the networks that uh, get built out. Uh, could you kind of elaborate on, on how sensing and fiber optics relates to that? That's a great question, Mark. Uh, you know, uh, a, a major component of burgeoning 5G deployment is the connection to small cells via fiber optic cables. So while fiber optics are already ubiquitous, they're going to start to become even more ubiquitous. And so uh, naturally, uh, 5G uh, is going to be embedded with fiber optics. So we could additionally start to connect our interrogators and integrate maybe even in the deployment of 5G equipment. Uh, uh, with fiber optic sensing, so so for sure it's it's going to enable us another avenue to be able to um, deploy fiber optic sensing, and it could be naturally part of uh, that cost of deployment, and it could maybe even to some uh, in some extent um, create some value adds that create make the total cost of ownership of 5G uh, even more valuable. I'd also like to to add to that uh, that of course the f yeah. The 5G network is going to become critical uh, to certain services. There are essential services, you know, data, you know, connectivity that needs to be continuous and sustained. Uh, things like autonomous vehicles, for example, are going to rely on data that's transferred over the 5G network. And therefore, you might want to actually protect it. To, you know, so, of course, yeah, you, you're going to have fiber cables with multiple cores, a lot, most of which are there for communicating, but you'll want to use one of those fibers potentially to monitor with DAS and to actually protect that fiber so that you know if there's a threat to it, somebody uh, yeah, digging nearby or possibly for someone with ill intent that is opening a manhole cover, thinking of tampering with the cable uh, and causing some trouble. So let me ask this uh, uh, from one of our, do, do you think that uh, we will see more specialized interrogator units soon, uh, cheaper, simpler, or more rugged devices that are easier for placement? Yes, I, I think for sure. I think in general, interrogator technology is always changing. It's, it's always being updated. I mean, even in the few years that I've been involved in fiber optic sensing, uh, it's amazing the, the things that have been done in, in, in those years. So I think for sure it's going to evolve, it's going to improve, and I think the improvements and the evolution is going to lend itself toward, to the, the question, easier deployment, uh, easier setup, um, and things like this. So I, I think for sure. And you referenced uh, dig once in your presentation, and uh, uh, I, I, could you kind of elaborate on, on how that produces savings? Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, uh, when when we lay cables, when pe when people lay cables, so they're typically for fiber optic cables. They're typically doing that with telecommunication in mind. So, uh, of course, naturally. Uh, 
they will do that along roads and highways because uh, that that is uh, makes it uh, facilitates the deployment of those uh, cables. Uh, however, if they don't think about sensing, then they may put a cable in a place where uh, sensing with fiber optics uh, maybe otherwise not optimal. Uh, so, and all the value adds I laid out, uh, we, that Stuart and I laid out for fiber optic sensing, uh, they they will bring value to a lot of the, the civic uh, the civic authorities. So, therefore, you want to just you don't want to have to lay an additional cable. You don't want to have to change the location of the cable that you just laid. Uh, you want to make sure that you're using the correct conduit, the correct cable that that is optimal and doesn't interfere with communication, but also uh, helps fiber sensing. So dig once really means that I one time pay to put in uh, all the fiber optic infrastructure conduit cable fiber in such a way that it, it, it helps the primary goal, which is to communicate, but also is optimal to do sensing, which provides additional value adds. Yeah, with, with hurricanes and other weather events gaining attention, uh, for example, obviously the areas around New Orleans uh, that lost power up to two weeks. Is there a path for sensing to be mandated to be used in critical infrastructure like electric grid or dams or levees? Yeah, and, and I'll let I'll let Stuart comment on this one, but I think for sure, you know, it, in in general, uh, the the key the key point is that uh, fiber optics, uh, they can do sensing when you put this interrogator at one point at the beginning and over many, many, many tens of miles, you can sense every few feet, every few meters, with no electrical power, no wired or wireless communication, et cetera, et cetera. So for sure, it's gonna be able to improve a lot of the things that we're doing now, like monitor and help mitigate uh, environmental disasters like flooding uh, and hurricanes, et cetera. Um, especially how it affects the electrical power infrastructure and other things. And maybe I'll let, if Stuart has any other uh, thoughts on this, I'll let him comment. But for sure, I think I think that we're going to get to a point where people are going to see the advantages and see that uh, it's going to be necessary to help us uh, deal with natural disasters better. Yeah, so I certainly support that view. Uh, obviously, you know, we, most of what's been presented today has been around uh, distributed acoustic sensing, but there's also... Yeah, these these interrogators can uh, sense changes in strain, uh, changes in temperature. So you th can think about you know fibers embedded in dam walls or levees uh, that will be able to very quickly uh, and with great deal of sensitivity uh, sense you know change in shape uh, or strains developing in these structures. So yeah, there have been collapses in dams over the years that have been documented. Uh, we could get early warning on those sorts of things, failures of bridges, um, you know, uh, the power infrastructure uh, you know, has been mentioned a couple of times. You know, perhaps starting to de detect, uh, you know, changes um, that where things are starting to deteriorate, uh, you know, over time because you can kind of think about how infrastructure has a, a sort of acoustic signature. If you like, imagine each time a you know a vehicle runs over a road or a train runs over tracks, it will make it vibrate uh, and give us a certain signature with the journey. But if you look at how that changes, repeated you know repeated journeys over uh, days, weeks, months, you can look for changes and get, get early signs, indications of these things. Uh, so yeah, I think that's a really tremendous area for this technology. Next, could you uh, comment on, on the comparative advantages of using uh, sensing uh, uh, compared with uh, uh, other uh, fiber optic sensing compared with other sensors, for example, video cameras? So what are the, the trade-offs? What are the cost advantages? What are the uh, pros and cons of each approach? And that, that's a great question. You know, I think... Um, of course, uh, as fiber optic sensing advocates, we we always want to say fiber optic sensing is the best. Like any advocate for anything always wants their thing to be the best. So, but we what we really should say is not that fiber optic sensing will replace or will be better, uh, but more it will complement. Uh, all sensors have different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, for example, cameras. Uh, some some well known things about cameras, especially when you're trying to apply machine machine vision to cameras or, or uh, visibility, line of sight. 
Uh, you have to get the data from the camera out somehow. So, so you know, the, these are things that people who uh, are doing um, camera technologies have to deal with all the time. And fiber optic sensing can complement that because perhaps uh, you have both. You have a camera using maybe, for example, machine vision and fiber optic sensing. And maybe the camera is dealing with some visibility problems the fiber optic sensing can continue to sense. So I, I would kind of say it's uh, more of a complementary thing. Fiber optic sensing, of course, again, does not require electrical power along the fiber. It does not require any uh, independent wired or wireless communication. It's immune to electromagnetic interference. It can withstand extreme temperatures and pressures. Uh, and it, you don't need line of sight for it to work, et cetera. And so it could definitely uh, be advantageous in conditions where cameras uh, may may have trouble. So it, either, I would say, not necessarily um, being better, but in some cases, for sure, having different advantages. But for sure, there's it's something that's going to be complementary and it, and as ubiquitous as cameras in, in the years to come. Yeah, no, that's a couple of thoughts for me. I certainly support everything you've said there. Uh, you know, it is complementary technology. Um, but one of the key advantages we always say with, with fiber is, you know, whereas most sensors are point sensors or have a limited field of view, line of sight, um, or they give you an update just you know, at certain periodic intervals, the beauty of fiber is you've got continuous monitoring over distance and time. So you, you don't miss anything uh, while you're monitoring. Uh, the other thing is, that when combined with other technologies, you think about, um, imagine monitoring a, um, a border. And if, you, if you're doing that with cameras and you had, you potentially have hundreds of cameras along your border, or you've got your border guards who are patrolling. Uh, if they, how, how do you know which camera to be watching at any given moment? Or how do you know where to direct your border guards to give them the best chance of catching something happening? Well, that's where DAS can be the foundational technology. So by monitoring continuously uh, over distance and time, you're there to sense that something is happening at a particular location. So you can say, right, look at this camera, get it turned around, zoomed in on this patch of ground at this moment in time, or send the security guard to that particular location because that's where they've got trade. So I, I quite like that approach as a, a way of actually making or helping you to use those other sensors and those other resources more effectively and make them more successful. Uh, you might also uh, comment a little bit on the privacy trade-offs, uh, uh, the ability to sensing not to necessarily involve uh, personally identifiable information where uh, cameras may well raise uh, some of the um, some concerns about uh, or a big brother. That, that's a great point, Mark. And, and of course, uh, very publicly, uh, not too long ago, many very uh, notable, um, well-known companies have kind of spoken out against um, cameras or uh, because of the some concerns over privacy. Uh, so of, of course, you could consider even a surveillance application where you, you need to be able to protect your assets like a perimeter. Uh, or like a border like Stuart described, and uh, you have cameras and now you are in danger of uh, dealing with them, kind of burgeoning privacy issues. So a fiber optic can, can help there. You know, fiber, fiber optic can kind of uh, assuage those privacy issues. It can be used to detect all, all the great things like uh, in, in climbing, cutting, digging under a fence, or crossing a border, driving along the border, climbing a wall along a border, et cetera. Just, just as one example, I'm, I'm talking about security, but I'm sure everyone um, can envision other examples where fiber optic sensing can help to assuage the concerns um, that we're starting to have over privacy. Uh, you referenced uh, some of the legislation that is in track and, and many of these uh, bills are, uh, reflect sort of current and past efforts to set up sort of demonstration projects, sort of best cases or best use cases for uh, uh, smart cities. Um, could you kind of comment on what are the best examples where fiber optic sensing has been uh, used as part of a, a smart city, smart communities demonstration project that uh, folks can look at? Yeah, I'll give I'll give my example, and I'm sure Stuart will have a uh, his right. <laughs> so I would say, um, so kind of 
selfishly, you know, NEC has um, kind of publicly created a very great partnership with Verizon, Verizon being um, one of the leaders in fiber optic uh, telecommunication in the United States. And we have started to um, plug in our interrogators to all, to many, I should tell, but many of the uh, Verizon's uh, networks around the United States. And so for sure, we have some uh, public results that are showing now by doing that, we can get a lot of these smart city functionalities like the ability to detect temperature, vibration, traffic, uh, infrastructure, as I showed in some of the slides. So, so I think, uh, at least for me, these are exciting examples, and not because NEC is doing it, but specifically because we're we're kind of uh, one of the first times showing that the existing infrastructure, just plugging in the box, it's already there, doesn't interfere with the communication. We can do all these other things. So that that's why it's uh, been exciting for me. Yeah, thanks. That, that is a good one. Um, I, I, from Photex side. Um, Probably one of the projects that we're most pr most proud of and having good fun with is um, what's called the Simulate uh, project. It's something that's funded by the uh, Department of Transport in part here in the UK. Uh, and that's where we are using fiber spanning a crossroads uh, four way intersection to track the um, traffic that's approaching that crossroads uh, from quite a way out, you know, sort of up to a kilometer in each direction. And we are you know, classifying uh, the cars from the vans and from the lorries, and then basically using that information to sequence the traffic lights in a smarter way uh, with a view to reducing uh, the emissions. So we do that by trying to keep those heavy lorries moving uh, so they don't have to decelerate and accelerate as they go through that junction. And um, you know, that has a, a meaningful impact uh, for air quality in the local area, affecting uh, residents living nearby uh, and you know, pupils at the school uh, that's nearby as well. And, and I really like that because it means that the, tel you know, the telecoms company, you know, it's their fiber is effectively, as well as you know, allowing the nearby residents to you know, watch their favorite shows on telly and speak to their friends and everything, it's also helping bring about cleaner air in their local environment. So it really is a, a great you know, dual use of that um, technology. And as that's scaled up over a larger area, uh, then you know, greater wins and returns can be um, delivered. And let me just do a follow-up question to Gio. You referenced the, the work that you're doing with uh, uh, Verizon. Um, as I understand it, that's using existing fiber, and it isn't necessarily installing new fiber in order to uh, uh, take advantage of some of the potential. Uh, that, that's right, Mark. And just for, that's a great example, Stuart. I, I didn't even think about that in, um, in terms of um, kind of helping with pollution by uh, affecting the way that these uh, large vehicles speed up and slow down. I, I think that's a great example. But yeah, yes, with uh, with Verizon. Uh, yes, it's it's all their existing infrastructure. It's a mostly their existing telecommunication infrastructure, um, and so so yes, so we we are plugging in our interrogators to uh, telecom carriers existing telecommunication infrastructure, and and again some of this stuff is interesting because we we don't know how some of that cable is buried, and and most telecom carriers don't. Uh, we we don't know uh, what you know uh, this you know after many years the kind of conduit the number of strands of fiber the type of cable. But you know we have the ability using things like machine learning to kind of tune into uh, the right things to to make to make them optimal. And so with, with a, any given telecom infrastructure, we can kind of plug in and we can get a lot of these value adds we described. So so yes, we're using the existing infrastructure, but of course, kind of lending itself towards uh, dig once. You know, the telecom companies will continue to deploy fibers, and as they deploy now, um, with by proving that we have been able to get fiber optic sensing to work with existing telecom infrastructure. Now this may uh, help to um, push telecom carriers to deploy dig once the right way for telecommunication uh, and sensing. So I guess the short answer is while old fiber can be used, uh, planning for the future involves making sure that uh, uh, fiber is, uh, uh, in, is uh, made part of the broader network and in, in encouraging uh, more uses for the future. Uh, gentlemen, I'm afraid we're at the uh, hour. 
Um, so uh, we'll have to stop there. And this has been a, an extremely informative uh, webinar. Um, as is always the case, and, and I know you referenced it earlier, uh, this will be available on the FOSA YouTube page along with uh, our channel, I should say, along with the uh, many other uh, use cases and webinars that uh, we include. And that concludes our webinar.